Hi, thanks for joining us today for our Women in GitOps event to celebrate International Women's Day. My name is Priyanka Ravi, and I am a developer experience engineer here at Weaveworks, and I will be moderating today's session. It's really great uh, to you know, uh, have everyone here today. So um, if you would, please let us know where you're dialing in from in the chat, and if you have any questions for the panelists. Um, hopefully you're here today to hear from our wonderful panelists on their journeys in tech and GitOps. If you're brand new to our various WeWorks or GitOps talks or series, welcome. And if you've been coming to these sessions for a while, welcome back. A little bit of background, if this is your first time coming to one of these events, the company that I work for is called WeWorks. If you haven't heard of us, we are a startup with offices all over the world, San Francisco, New York, London, Berlin, as well as distributed and remote teams across the globe. A lot of what we do is based on open source. You might have heard of our projects Flux and Flagger, which are in the CNCF as incubating projects. And we're in the process of submitting the application of graduate. I actually think we actually did just submit the application to graduate. So, um, and then Flux was also the project that really kicked off the term that our CEO, Alexis Richardson coined, GitOps. And it's really been cool to watch it spread like wildfire and see the community grow over the last few years. So much so that large organizations like AWS, Microsoft and others, have adopted it and are using it under the hood to actually offer GitOps to their customers. If you missed our GitOps one-stop shop event back in October of last year, you can find that playlist on our YouTube channel and watch all of the different vendors who've integrated Flux within their products. Cortex is another one of our products that is used in the CNCF that helps make Prometheus scalable. I mentioned that um, simply because Prometheus is a key part of the progressive delivery possibilities with Flagger. So that's one key option that we have there. And of course, other projects like Weave Ignite, EKS Cuddle, and now Weave GitOps, which is also a free and open source tool that provides GitOps for your various needs and has a UI on top of Flux. And we have many, many more. So if you are interested, uh, definitely check us out on GitHub under Weaveworks, as well as the CNCF where you can find our projects. And um, to learn more about us, you can always visit our website, which is weave.works. A little bit of housekeeping. We've actually bookmarked an hour for today's session, and I'm sure I don't have to explain too much about Zoom these days. But the one thing I will mention here is that unless you have something burningly private to share with just us in the chat, um, be sure to change the to uh, to everyone so that everyone in the audience can see your question and comment. Um, and also sometimes our audience members answer each other's questions too. So please make sure you do that. Otherwise, we'll also be copying and pasting those if you do accidentally send it to us. Um, you may also want to change your Zoom view gallery, view setting to gallery so that you can actually see our entire panel as we're chatting. And just a quick note um, that I'll keep track of all the questions in the chat and we'll get to them at either pauses in the discussion or at the end. So we have a ton of talks booked for this spring session for our online user group. And these are some of them that are coming up. So please come back and join us for all of these great sessions. All right, I wanna introduce our um, panelists. Uh, first, we have Cornelia Davis, who is a products manager uh, for Alexa AI at Amazon. And then we also have Philippa Dabroga. Uh, she's an engineering manager here at Weaveworks and then, <laughs> Last but not least, we have May Large, um, who's a staff field engineer at VMware, and May actually used to be my boss back at State Farm. So very excited to have you guys here today. So if you would, please turn on y'all's cameras and unmute yourselves, and then we will go ahead and get started. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. All right. Very excited to have you guys here. Um, first things first, do you guys mind, uh, you know, introducing yourselves and then also uh, explaining how y'all got started with GitOps? And we'll start with you, Cornelia. Sure, sure. Thank, thanks so much for having me and happy International Women's Day to everyone out there. It is indeed a grand day. Um, I, again, my name is Cornelia Davis. I have been in the tech space. I've been working. I graduated college over 30 years ago, so I've been doing this for a long time. Um, started my career in aerospace, working on embedded systems, and then in the late 90s, had the great opportunity to move over into web. 
Um, and that was the beginning of my distributed systems journey. And I worked on web architectures in a number of different settings and then spent um, nearly a decade at Pivotal doing developer platforms, um, DevOps platforms that really kind of brought, that helped developers get into the modern way of building and bringing their software to the web. Um, I spent uh, a year and a half at Weaveworks, and, um, which was a delightful time, and I'll be talking a lot about that time and, and the knowledge that I gained during that over the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Um, and these days, in the last six months or so, I am working on Amazon Alexa, which I'll tell you is kind of fun because it's the first time where I can be at a grocery store and somebody says, oh, what do you do for work? And I say, I work on Alexa. And they get so excited. It's the first time in my career I've worked on a consumer product. Um, so there is that fun element. Um, so thank you for having me. I guess I'll go next. My name is May Large. I am Pinky's momager before. <laughs> we worked together at State Farm. Um, I started my career back in 2000. I've always been in IT. I grew up as a developer. Um, and yet I always carved out time for all the devops -y topics. And that's always been a passion of mine. So I do whatever feature or task was assigned to me, but then I'd carve out time to, hey, this is really interesting and will make my life easier as I tried to realize my code change to the hands of our customers. And that's been my brand throughout the years. And I recently moved to VMware as a field engineer. Um, big thanks to GitOps, because that's really what got me into the role I'm playing in right now. And the best way, I just described this yesterday, because I was in a separate, me a different meeting with Pinky yesterday, that my role really has not changed. As a GitOps platform team, I am performing the same role, but at a bigger magnitude because I'm not only catering to product teams at State Farm, but our different customers and partners at VMware. All right, I'll make the last of the introductions then. I um, originally come from a software development background. I've had a number of gigs in that space over the years, uh, but really got into cloud infrastructure and sort of that as, a, as an early uh, adopter, as it were, must have been in 2015, I want to say, or something probably. Um, Kubernetes was, was not really on the cards yet. Uh, or maybe I think it was around, but there was still Mesos Marathon and uh, Docker Swarm was a thing and nobody really knew where the industry was going. And in that tumultuous time, uh, I was tasked as the resident infrastructure person to come up with a plan for a brand new um, sort of sort of paths for the business to experiment with new products on. We had a bunch of engineers who were really, really keen on this microservices thing that everybody was doing or everybody was talking about, but nobody really knew how to do. And uh, so, so I found myself having to sort of come up with a plan. And um, I made a bet at the time that Kubernetes would become a big thing. Uh, I, I think I got that kind of right. Um, and, and luckily enough, uh, we had at the time the, the, the funding to actually make this happen. And um, at that point, really, I discovered that building an infrastructure platform was really only the first step on a very, very long journey. Because once you've got your Kubernetes cluster in Amazon, it's all good and well, but how are you going to get your 150 plus microservices onto that cluster and make sure they stay running and make sure you've got the right version of everything? And it was a real headache and, and I was in a real pickle trying to figure out what to do. And, and that was the point where um, I, I can't, and I don't want to want to sort of sort of not give credit here, but I can't remember exactly who it was, but but somebody on my team suggested we look into this GitOps idea that uh, uh, Alexis at the time was was already talking about. Flux, I think, was just sort of appearing, and uh, so so that's where we started. We, we looked into it, and I realized this is actually going to solve all of these problems. 
yeah, it's early time, uh, early days, and it's going to need some some work to integrate with everything else, and we're going to have a lot of stuff to figure out. But this was the path forward, and I'm I'm you know really really grateful that that you know I got the opportunity to to get on that particular train that early because it certainly has been an amazing ride, and I would never have thought back then that it would one day lead me to managing the team that looks after Flux and Flagger. I'm so excited. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, it's say, I guess same for me too, right? Like I, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for like the journey May and I were on either. Um, so that's really funny. Um, <clears throat> I will throw this one to you May first. Uh, basically, thank what are you, some of the, <laughs> 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 but it sounds like Philippa has brought a lot of user experience too. So what are some of the challenges you faced, you know, starting with the process through the process kind of thing? It's nothing unique really to GitOps, uh, but basically to answer the question, it's scale, right? Here's a very good approach. It reinforces all the best practices up front on how you get, I always, uh, I may sound like a broken record for every time I talk about GitOps, um, the lesser there's, the less context switching there is, the better, right? I as a developer, that feature is fresh in my mind, how I coded that, how I tested it, the scanning that went on, I need that in the hands of our customers right away. And GitOps being the foundational piece behind that. And so it's a very good solution. How do you scale that to an organization with different areas, different teams, different kinds of workloads? Um, that's, that's really the, I guess, the, the main thing that we had to figure out up front. Like it, we know how it works. We know how it should be adopted. How do we get that to scale throughout our, how many product teams do we cater to? I, I had the stats before, but I don't have it anymore. <laughs> uh, I was asking Russ for a number the other day. I think it, 5, like, it's 800, some, there was yeah. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And 5,000, 7,000 developers. So yeah. 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 So, so I want to jump in. I'm actually going to back us up a little bit because we all hinted at it a little bit during our intros. Um, and, but I want to, I want to step back and talk a little bit about kind of the, the birth of, of GitOps. Um, and um, honestly, because if you remember when I said where I started, I, I spent the, about a decade working on developer platforms. And then F Philippa said, she talked about PaaS in May, you talked about developers and, and, make, and, and invade, um, enabling them to be more efficient. So we all share that as the background. And that really, to me, was the, the underpinning of GitOps, was this need to become more efficient. And so um, people ask all the time, especially with my time at WeaveWorks, how I got involved in GitOps. And it really, it started 10 years ago, well before we envision GitOps the way it is today. And I think that there's a couple of factors that came into play. One was, again, these developer platforms, and I mentioned the word DevOps before. The birth of GitOps really started back in the gestation, if you will, started with DevOps. It was about this ability to really streamline the process from idea out to production, get feedback, update the idea, and, and really close that loop very, very quickly. And in the early days of DevOps, and, and in fact, a good portion of the DevOps um, uh, emphasis is still in the early parts of the software development lifecycle. There's still an awful lot. If you go to DevOps conferences, they still talk a lot about test automation and Jenkins pipelines and all of that stuff. Then Kubernetes, and you had a great intuition. I think you, you nailed it. Kubernetes was the thing to bet on because you had this new way of of applications being able to be run, this new kind of foundational infrastructure. Where GitOps came into play was tying these two things together. It was the early parts of the development life cycle and the operational side. And it said, well, okay, Kubernetes said, once you get things out to me, I'll keep them running for you. And the Jenkins pipeline said, okay, I'll help you get the stuff ready to be run. What was missing was that center part. And so I think that it's really important to understand the goals of GitOps. The goals of GitOps are all about really finishing that entire pipeline so that the entire thing is automated, not just the software development, not just the keeping it running in production, 
but we will need to link all those things together. And I think that is that context is really important for us to understand as we think through the elements of GitOps. I think that's actually a really important point. And it, it's funny that, that you mentioned DevOps because DevOps, like it, it started out as this great idea and remember the, the DevOps manifesto and all that. And it has now become this thing that means whatever I want it to mean today, you know, and for many organizations, I've, I've done some consulting in between and worked for a lot of, or with a lot of larger organizations. And for a lot of them, DevOps basically means that person who runs our Jenkins for us. And yep. you know, the, the, the core of DevOps really was this idea that the developers, the owners of the code should be intimately involved with the operations, with the running, the keeping it running, the, the evaluating that it is stable and performing well, and ultimately the customer experience or the user experience that the, their, their software is delivering. And that saw a lot of resistance in my experience, both from engineering managers who said it's never going to work, it's never going to work for us, we've got regulatory you know, firewalls that we can't get through, and also from developers who said, my job is to write code, not to make sure that it actually works. And um, <laughs> to, you know, maybe a bit but, but that certainly is an, is an attitude you, you still often find. And I think one key requirement in order to bridge this gap was to make ops palatable to software developers, to take away this, this air of staring at an information radiator and when some red light goes on you click a button or something and moving it towards now actually this is a developer job with developer tools and what more central developer tool is there than git and when you get to a point where getting a new version of your software out into production is essentially a git commit and a git push, just like any other change to your software, now you're suddenly in a place where you can talk to developers and you can say, yes, this is new responsibilities, but you're going to deal with those responsibilities the same way you've been dealing with all your previous responsibilities already anyways. Yeah, that was fantastically put. I, I totally, yeah, everything you said, well, well said, yeah. Um, all right, let's move on to security because I know that's like a big thing, DevSecOps, right? Going on from DevOps, DevSecOps was like the next term that came like into full circle. So um, basically a current big focus uh, is security. So what's your advice to users to ensure that they are security minded? And I think we'll start with Philippa on this one. Security is, is one, of these, one of these tricky topics, right? Because we build these systems that try to abstract away from us things that we don't need to worry about right now in order so that we can streamline our thinking, right? As a, as a Kubernetes microservices outfit, uh, you know, for the most part, I'm gonna be thinking in terms of Kubernetes primitives, I'm gonna be thinking about my, my workloads and that helps me focus on what I need to get done. I don't need to worry about everything underneath. I don't need to worry about how Kubernetes does what it does and how it even got there. But for security, that approach doesn't work. And security really has to be part of everything that we do in the entire software life cycle, in the infrastructure life cycle. There's, there's no point in having the most secured Kubernetes control plane and the best software dependency scanning technology and all these things if the Kubernetes nodes are running a five-year-old version of Linux with you know, who knows what vulnerabilities. So security needs to be an inter integral part of everybody's job, be it an infrastructure engineer, a, a test automation person, a, a core developer, whatever flavor of, of contribution you have to making a piece of software happen, you have a job in security. I'm going to add on to what Philippa said, and you did a fantastic job in really outlining that, in a, especially in a large organization, we all assume different personas. 
and tend to think, oh, my job is to keep this code, this piece of code, line of code that I'm adding on, this is secure. As soon as it passes a static scan analysis, I am golden, right? But we're, there are different personas to exactly to what uh, Philippa already um, talked about. There's more beyond the code that you write. You have your dependencies. You have the CI CD solution or tooling that you're using, right, to get it out to an environment. And you have your third party dependencies. Then you have to run uh, runtime analysis on that, right? How is it performing? Like I'm talking about dynamic application scanning, black box testing. And then Pinky and I dealt with this with a lot of pen testing that happened, especially on the solutions that we built uh, to support GitOps. And while that, those were all painful, those were necessary. And we definitely learned a lot. That really had us rethink how we're promoting or we're, how are we um, producing these reusable Terraform modules for our GitOps consumers to use. It really brought a lot of light onto what we're doing. And it doesn't stop there. I mean, th they're scanning on your images. Your registry should be scanned. And to Philippa's point, your runtime environment, you have to know that because one weakness there can totally be exploited. Yeah, the thing that I'll add from a security perspective is, you know, I'm the old lady here, so um, I can bring in a lot of perspective from the, from the olden days. And there was a time where, um, and it wasn't in fact that long ago, where we thought that we achieved security by maintaining stability. And by stability, I mean lack of change. So the less you change things, you would do all this work ahead of time to try to make things secure. And then you achieve this level of security and then just don't touch anything. And it's going to remain secure. And that's not the world we live in anymore. Everything's always changing. The cloud is always changing. The infrastructure is changing. I mean, there was, I, I worked back at Documentum, which was a traditional enterprise company. And I remember we used to keep that like that ticker of the number of days since you've had an accident, except for it was the number of days since we've had to reboot a server um, or had to restart some process. And we could, good numbers were like 278 days or something like that where you didn't change anything. Well, now the average lifespan of a container running on Kubernetes is on the order of days. Maybe it's less than that. Maybe it's hours. And so the role that GitOps can play, um, just like we've talked about GitOps helping you get your applications out there. But now what we need to do is, and we're increasingly doing, is expressing security policies. Whether those security policies are access control policies or network policies or policies around the dependencies in some software that you're bundling, knowing that you're up to the latest version of some embedded you know, spring package or something like that because we've had zero day exploits. It's expressing all of those policies in such a way that they can be applied in the same way that we apply to GitOps to applications, which is we express them in a declarative way. And then we've got agents that are, we've got, of course, something like Flux, which is making sure that those policies are always applied and make sure that there are no changes in the runtime environment that are not reflected back in the declarative policy. So it's, Flux plays that role. And then we've got the Kubernetes or something like that system that's also always making sure that there isn't some divergence from what we have in Git. And so applying that to security policies, applying that same mindset of declarative configuration um, to security is the way that it's the only tenable way that you can handle the level of change that happens in the world of our, our software applications today. And I think that's really critical when it comes to kind of security thinking. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely very important. I agree with you. Um, so, I mean, y'all have already kind of hit on this, but like basically what are some of the benefits that y'all have actually experienced using GitOps? Maybe I can make a, make a start with that one, given, given how, how early we started using using GitOps. Yeah. We actually, uh, at some point, we, we built our own GitOps uh, tooling in order to, to deliver what we needed at the time for the business. Um, but 
it doesn't actually, and I think that is the, the beauty of it. It doesn't actually matter what exactly your tooling looks like because at the core of it is always Git. And that gives you uh, a huge amount of benefit that you're kind of taking for granted when you're doing software development. Like for example, this, you know, I, I always joke that the Git was the first blockchain, right? You get you get this, this immutable history of, of all the changes that have happened to your code base. And um, that actually is, is an incredibly important component to, to what, to me, makes GitOps so amazing. Because once we apply that to things like Kubernetes manifests, um, you have that audit trail. You can see exactly who merged the change to a container image version when. And I remember um, relatively early on when we were doing this, we were in a situation where some vulnerability or security relevant bug was discovered by a development team in a, in a service that they owned. And um, we needed to be able to say exactly from what point in time that could have potentially been exploited. We, we couldn't know whether anybody had found it, but we needed to, to basically be able to say the, the earliest records that could possibly have been affected were at this point. And previously, it would have been incredibly difficult to say, well, you know, we can see when the change was merged, but but when did that actually go into production? Could have been a week later? You know, maybe if we're lucky, we're doing releases every Wednesday, so probably the next Wednesday, but there's no guarantees. With the GitOps model, all I need to do is I need to go back to when that commit was made that triggered the rollout of that version. And I can say within a few minutes accuracy, this is the point where this change went live. So I'll, I'll speak about one. I wasn't at Waveworks when this happened, but how can we possibly have a conversation around the benefits of GitOps without going back to the outage, right? So the big story of the outage, most of you on the audience maybe have already heard about this, um, but there's a little nuance maybe that you haven't heard about, which is, so let me tell you about the outage. This was in the earlier days of Weaveworks. Weaveworks was not a GitOps company. GitOps was not a term that had been coined. Weaveworks was a company that was bringing a Kubernetes as a service to the world. So we were running Kubernetes as a, a service and of course, we were running it as a production service. So we had production policies in place. We had ways of running that application. And um, what was interesting about this outage, and the outage happened, it, it was almost predicted um, or was predicted by one of the operations engineers who said, ah, I'm about to apply a change that I'm not 100% certain of. It might take things down. And you know what? It did. But the good news is that in about 40 minutes, we had it back up. So talk about benefits of GitOps. Now, I'll tell you, I'll say a little bit more about how GitOps played a role here in just a moment, because the term didn't even exist. But that's a huge benefit of whatever it is that this team had done, was that in 40 minutes, they were able to reestablish that entire service. It was a full, complete outage, and they were able to reestablish it. And what they had done was they, they had implemented some very disciplined processes. And this is often the way things start, is we come up with these processes and we implement them, and they were really great at that. They had created the processes. What did the processes look like? Well, they had the discipline to say, we never coop cuddle apply anything. We never apply anything to the runtime system first. That was discipline number two. I mean, number one. Discipline number two was, okay, we are gonna record everything that we're eventually gonna do over in the system in an immutable version store. Yeah, that was discipline. I'm emphasizing this because this was all human discipline. We're not gonna apply things in the runtime system first. We're gonna capture things in Git and then they ran the coop couple apply commands or whatever the equivalent was. Then they ran the commands that drew from Git and stood up the running system. All three of those steps were done by humans. And the big epiphany was, 
oh my gosh, if we automate that, which is human discipline today, then we've got a game changer. And that, and that whole process that I just talked about, flux did not exist. That was the, the nugget. That was the, hey, if we automate this disciplined process, what would that look like? And that was the beginning of flux. And if you will, kind of the beginning of GitOps. So that's a huge benefit, 40 minutes. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Definitely. That's awesome. And I think that's actually, you know, 40 minutes even, even is, is comparatively long, right? Most of that time will be spent for things to reconcile and infrastructure to happen or whatever. The actual work you as an engineer have to do is essentially as, as easy, quote unquote, easy as a, a git revert, git push, and then letting the tooling that we now have do its thing. And, um, you know, if you build your software with that scenario in mind, if that's something that is important to you, you can shave much more time off of that. Uh, you know, I, I remember one instance where, uh, you know, the, the proverbial, um, you know, we all make that mistake the first time, oops, I accidentally deleted all of production thing happened. Um, and um, that was simply then a case of, because we had, all the manifests in Git, we knew exactly what the state of production was supposed to look like. And so simply reapplying that and waiting for Kubernetes to do its thing from having no processes running to all our customers are happy again in five, 10 minutes is totally achievable. Yeah, I mean, I think part of the 40 minutes was remember all three steps were driven by humans. Mm -hmm. As soon as you automate that, and humans, of course, were being very careful and making sure that they were doing, you know, humans are error prone, much more error prone than computers. So as soon as you automate that, I would say that of that 40 minutes, probably at least half of it was just humans doing their, their slow cognitive loop, right? Um, and so if you can automate that, yeah, that same scenario probably would have taken 10 or 15 minutes today with flux in place. And let us not forget the amount of nerves and stress and right. Yeah, I was gonna say part of it was probably freaking like, out. <laughs> like like what, once you once you're at a point where you can trust your tooling and you know if my declarative stuff, my, my declaration is good, and mm -hmm. I can ask, you know, take my time, I can ask my colleagues to have an eye over that. Mm -hmm. Once I apply that, everything will happen automatically. And I don't need to worry about mistyping a command or you know, getting a namespace wrong or something. Uh, that takes a huge burden off of the engineers who actually have to take responsibility for, uh, you know, delivering to, to customers. And uh, I think that is something that, that cannot be overstated, how much of a difference that makes, you know, when you're, when you're holding that pager and, and you know when that goes off, you can be in a, in a world of pain or knowing that when that pager goes I have all the tools in place. I have all the records I need. I can always go back to the last known good state. And, um, you know, very, very rarely will I be in a place where I don't know what to do anymore. It's a good point. It's, it's a peace of mind for sure. It always happens on a Friday for Pinky and I. <laughs> it, it did. Does. It always oh, did. It always. Pinky. It always <laughs> did. <laughs> I don't have much else to add, but just the fact that a sign of a great solution is when the solution gets out of the way, right? Mm -hmm. It gets you to focus on what you got to do. And the, the discipline that Cornelia really honed in on is, is already there. It's the foundational piece. You're embracing the declarative nature. You know exactly how to fix a problem because, again, the solution, GitOps, right, gets out of the way. It just does what it's supposed to do. Yeah. Agreed. And it also kind of sounds like we had a similar user experience, Philippa, I think May and I, where we also created a bunch of tooling uh, ourselves in originally. So um, because actually Kubernetes wasn't the first platform that we tackled. So it like Flux wasn't the first tool, but we did. Yeah, we did eventually use Flux. So that kind of leads me into the next question, which are um, what are some of y'all's personal favorite features of Flux? I just like that it, it does what it's supposed to do. <laughs> the interval that I set it on, it's gonna do what it's supposed to do, which is to pick up, is there a, is there a change? I especially love, right, the move to Flux 2, 
where I don't have to consume everything. And it comes in really handy for my new role now, right? We are catering to different customers who may not necessarily want all the bells and whistles that come with Flux One, right? So if I just need it, right? For what we're using it right now, I just need it to listen or watch this Git repository. I can figure the interval. I mean, it does what it's supposed to do. <laughs> can it make coffee and refill my coffee for me? Be, <laughs> now I'm focusing on what I'm supposed to do, right? So can you just take care of this? <laughs> but you're right, it is configurable. And like, like uh, I think that's, that's a very good point. It's like your user experience, you can tailor how you actually consume it. Like we didn't actually go into detail, I think with our experience with like the image controllers, um, so that's like something we never tackled, but like we got to like mess with the notification controller, uh, monitoring. So yeah, I agree with you that like there's a lot you can do with it, but there's like an easy step that you can start with and then grow from there. So yeah, it's a good point. And one of the things that I particularly like to be able to configure is um, I'm a huge fan, always have been of the pull model. And maybe it's because um, I... I'm often thinking of this distributed systems architecture that's the world I've been living in for 20 years, um, is this notion of, I, I, I'm not a big fan of centralized hubs. Now, there are some use cases where it's appropriate, and so you can have Flux running you know, on that central hub and pushing things out to the endpoints. And so back to your, your point, um, both of your point, Pinky and May, that um, the, the fact that you, you can choose what model you want to apply at a very granular level, that's what allows me to say, hey, pull is the best model, but acknowledge that sometimes push is, is, is better, um, is the right, is suitable in, in your particular use case. So I'm a big fan of the pull model, going back to the security as well. I think from, from that angle, my favorite thing about Flux is that it is open source. And, uh, you know, we, we spoke about security earlier. When you have tooling that is so central to how everything operates, that essentially has with, of course, you know, the, the human oversight of what goes into Git, but it ultimately has the keys to the castle to an extent. And um, so being able to inspect that, being able to, to understand the rationale behind what's changing, and of course, being able to contribute, right? If you have uh, something that you think would be really valuable, uh, you can do that. You know, May, if you, if you want that coffee making capability, uh, all I can say is pull request welcome. I'm just a pull request away. <laughs> doing that coffee. It, it, it really is, it really is. Yes. And, and the community is super, super welcoming. I think that's like one thing that we like to note as well is like we're welcoming for any kind of like beginner level experience, like whatever level of experience you have, we're super happy to have you. So if, yeah, like she said, if you want to contribute, please, please just open a pull request. We're very welcoming of that. Um, so what is something basically you wish you had known earlier on in your GitOps journey that maybe can help some other people with any of their troubles? What you just said, Pinky, is my answer. That there is a vibrant oh, community behind yeah. GitOps, behind Flux. It, there's, if and the wish, feature's not there, yeah. I yeah. wish we, we took advantage of that early on. I go back yeah. to our, our stint back at State Farm and the GitOps platform team. I wish we took advantage of that much sooner because there would have been key decision points that would have probably gone a different way if we had involved the community up front. Yeah, that is something I remember you mentioned yesterday too, when we were talking and it's like um, something that, like the community is so helpful and we didn't reach out to them as much as we could have. So yeah, that's like all those toolings that we created too are on, on our own, Philippa as well. Like for me and May, we maybe didn't need to create all of them necessarily. And so it would have been nice to like, you know, get some of that input for sure. Be able to harvest that power of the community and to Philippa's point, right? Contribute back and just, yes. it's, it's a community. So. Yeah. I think one of the things that I'll say that it took me a little while to really grok. And I think this is partly our fault in the GitOps community um, is that we don't highlight this point. And that is the closed loop nature of even an operator like Flux. Um, is the fact that it's so easy for us to think about it from the 
going forward perspective to say, ah, well, I'm not going to change things in production. I'm going to start and get get is the op, is the 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 interface for operations. I do everything over there, um, and that those changes will propagate over to Kubernetes. As soon as Kubernetes, the API server has it, it will make it so. It will eventually converge on what you have in Git. Um, the power that the opposite direction goes, the power of being able to, for example, do drift detection. And I can tell you that in my, I didn't go into the details, but I spent some time at EMC um, and so very large, you know, storage systems, and I was in the soft, more on the software side, but we, they had acquired a number of software companies, some of which were, a lot of which was around infrastructure management. And the complexity of these tools that were trying to keep tabs in your configuration management database what was actually running out in production, and then what you wanted to be running. That whole configuration management space, that's what GitOps addresses now. And so instead of having, and, and the way that that worked to a large extent, those systems worked is, yeah, we tried to have configurations and some configuration management database. Then we had some discipline that we used to apply it to the runtime systems. And then we had all sorts of complex stuff that was like trying to get a picture of what the real world looked like. And then we have complex systems that tried to compare those two. If you make that as a part of the inherent system, that it is GitOps is as much about the feedback loop as it is pushing things from Git out into the runtime system that changes the whole way that you can capture things, you know, address something like uh, drift detection and remediation from that drift, which has all sorts of downstream consequences, like the ability to be able to say, oh, when there's a zero day vulnerability, like a heart bleed or something like that, to be able to address it more efficiently, which puts you in a better security posture and so on. So you don't get all that for free just by going in the one direction you've got to close the loop in the other direction. And that took me a little while once I got into GitOps to really appreciate the, the, the other direction and the value that that can bring in all sorts of IT concerns. It's actually a really, really important point. And I think, you know, the one thing that I wish I had known sooner in my career was is, is how difficult it would be to paint that picture and to convince people of exactly that. Basically, ever since that sort of early day epiphany moment, I spent the rest of my career up to this point convincing other companies that I joined and worked with that GitOps is something that they should seriously consider. And the, 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 the way out is always fairly easy you know you you can you can demo that and people will go oh yeah right that is great make the changing git and then that goes into production that is basically our jenkins running kubectl apply just on steroids you know we're on board with that that's cool but then you say okay but but also if somebody goes and changes the cluster it'll put it back it'll make sure that that git really is always your source of truth no matter what happens and then suddenly people become a bit iffy, like, like oh, oh, I don't know about that, but, but what about if I have an outage? What if I need to quickly change something? And, and then you need to start really trying to get across why the right way to, to fix an outage is again to go through Git so that not only can you benefit from the history you already have, but also you can capture how you're fixing things and, and you, you, you never sort of sort of, you know, just, just kind of, kind of balancing out onto the rope without any, any safety mechanisms to try and get things running again. Um, and, and that has proven much more difficult than the, the sort of outward direction of like, like applying changes from Git to a production system. Yeah. Yeah. That's very good points. Yeah. Um, I uh, will take this time, I guess, to ask the audience if y'all have any questions. I do see that there is a question already on there. That is, uh, what are some resources to learn about GitOps? There are a bunch of resources out there. I don't know if y'all have any great favorites that y'all <laughs> use to kind of start y'all's process. Um, 
We, if you're like specifically for Flux, we do have really great documentation at fluxcd.io. Um, do y'all have any recommendations of any other like spots to go check out? I do. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, so there, there's a couple of them. You already mentioned one, Pinky, at the beginning, which is um, it depends. Everybody has different ways of learning. Um, I am somebody who I love to learn through watching um, talks and kind of get the, because I, I totally agree. I think Flux is great, but we've been talking about some of these nuances and you can get those nuances by listening to folks talk about experiences. So for example, May and Pinky have given some amazing talks on GitOps both at for um, at, at WeaveWorks events like GitOps days and those types of things, but also at um, the late the last KubeCon where we had uh, GitOps. Uh, what's it called? GitOps Con. Yeah. GitOps Con. There we go. Um, so that there are quite a number of resources out there um, along those lines, and uh, the group that Pinky is part of. Um, just does a tremendous job creating kind of video content, which is really great at giving you kind of the intros that that capture some of the nuances that you might miss if you just start to read about the mechanics of GitOps. So I would say that that's a really great place to start. And by the way, GitOps Con was put on by the GitOps Working Group, which is a group in the CNCF that brings together a whole bunch of people from across the industry, across a bunch of different vendors and users as well, to really develop the a body of content around and some standards around the GitOps space. So those are two of my favorites. One, one thing that I would like to add, because I always do, even though it is, it is maybe only tangentially related, uh, is the book Accelerate by Nicole Fosgren et al. Because one of the biggest challenges that I've encountered when trying to be a, a GitOps champion is to, first of all, especially in larger organizations, convincing people why the benefits of GitOps are actually benefits, why they are worthwhile. You know, the ability to get changes out into production more quickly, making the change sets smaller, having more frequent deploys, having developers involved in that whole life cycle. Um, you know, there are a lot of sort of old established organizations where, where engineering managers will tell you, why should I want that? I'm perfectly happy with my six month release cycle and I do, you know, four months of manual testing before I roll anything into production. And it only breaks like like 50% of the time. And when it does, we have it usually fixed within a week. So uh, being able to actually, not just anecdotally, but with, with data, and that's what the Accelerate book does really well, with hard data shows that there is a very strong correlation between good outcomes and the kinds of practices that GitOps encourages and enables. And it's been invaluable to me being able to go to CTOs and to, to senior engineering leaders and to say, see, this is not just me talking. Here are some numbers to show people who do this have these outcomes. People who don't do this have these much less favorable outcomes. And uh, that can really help sway people to take a shot, take a, take a risk, um, give this approach a try. And once people do that, I have found like, 10 times out of 10, they're, they're, they're glad they did. It's just, you know, getting over that hurdle and getting that picture painted and the story told that's hard. Really good point. Yeah, getting buy-in is always the most difficult, but I, I do agree. Leadership does love data for sure. So that's a good way to get people to buy in for sure. Um, and I think Stacy just put some like links to some resources in the chat as well. So if you do want to get started, that's those are great links to get started. Um, I I think we're going to wrap up here. I want to thank you guys so, so much for joining us. Y'all have been super awesome panelists. Super grateful to have y'all here. Um, and thank you to everyone else that joined us to come listen to these wonderful, powerful women in GitOps talk about their experiences. Um, we really appreciate everyone. And uh, feel free to join us for future meetups and check those out too. So thank you guys so much. This has been thank awesome. Thank you. It's been what a wonderful way to celebrate this day to be yeah, with all y'all. So thank you. It's been so nice. glad y'all are here. For my Flex t-shirt, Pinky. <laughs>
<laughs> I'll see what I can do. <laughs> I think the mouth listening. So there's. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's great to meet you, Philippa. It's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> Bye. Bye.